This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the Word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. If you have your Bibles today, I want to start in Matthew chapter 11, verses 11 through 15. This is Understanding the Kingdom, part 82. And I've entitled it, The Kingdom of God Suffers Violence. And if there was ever a time on planet Earth that we're seeing that, it's today in many, many different ways. In fact, I want to contrast it to Luke 16, which almost seems like Jesus is addressing the same thing, but he's really not. He's looking at it from a different direction. I want to start with verse 11 here in Matthew chapter 11. Assuredly, I say unto you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. <coughs> so he's saying no other prophet, no greater prophet. But notice he's now contrasting it to the kingdom of heaven. But he is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. It's talking about a different status. John the Baptist was pointing toward the kingdom, but he was a forerunner of the kingdom. Only Messiah can bring the kingdom. Okay. In verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violence take it by force. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now one of the things that has kind of troubled Bible commentators when you contrast it to Luke 16, which it's almost like Jesus is referring to the same thing, but in Luke 16, uh, Luke 16, 16, he's... He says this, the law and the prophets were until John, since the time of the kingdom of God has been preached, everyone is pressing into it. That pressing into it means to the crowd to get in. But when you look at Matthew chapter 11, the, the, the violence is of a negative context in the Greek. And so he's literally looking at these situations from two different sides. First, Jesus, let's go to, if we're looking at Matthew 16, the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. Everybody was rushing to get into the kingdom. Okay? And uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees had problems with that. You know, everybody's rushing to hear John. Who's this John? What's this John thing? And then the next thing you know, they're, they're all rushing to Jesus. And, and you hear over and over again in the gospels, we're afraid because all of them are following him. Now I'm going to say some things today that might not be too popular, but that's okay. What's interesting in Torah, there is no authorization for rabbis. Rabbi, the development of the rabbinical movement was as a result of the book of Malachi when God judged the Levites. They had violated their covenant because they began teaching the people what they wanted to hear instead of what they needed to hear. 
And many commentators said, well, you know, there's a lot of reason for that. A lot of it has to do with this, you know, money. And because they weren't teaching the people the plainness of God's Word, kind of like today. We're, we're, we're in a place that we can be judged, the church of the living God can be judged because we're just as guilty as the tribe of Levi is today, that we don't teach what sin is, we don't teach the ways of God, we use greasy grace as a way to placate the flesh. Amen. Come on. And I think in many ways, <coughs> the church is being judged today because it wasn't the church. It, we, we're not being preached the gospel of the kingdom. So, you know, God used that system. Jesus ended up being a traveling rabbi or a teacher. But as Messiah, he has a right to be, okay? But they, they borrowed authority from the people rather than from God to do what they were doing. So it was creating a system that found itself in competition with the kingdom. And they thought that they could use violence to get that movement. They persecuted the early church. They crucified the Lord of glory. Now, they were supposed to. I, I want to make that very clear. They were supposed to. The high priest, if he had not declared that, it would not have been a legitimate sacrifice. It was the duty of the high priest to choose the lamb out of Bethlehem that was supposed to be for all the people. Okay? He was following what God prescribed. But, and actually out of this whole bunch, the only one that was moving with authority, if you will, would have been the high priest, except he wasn't a Kohanim. Money had gotten him his position. In fact, we find out that actually John the, uh, John the Apostle was related to him. Things that make you, because politics messes up everything. And so we have, this, we have this contrasting here. People want to be a part of the kingdom of God if they're preached the kingdom. Not churchianity, not denominationalism. But the kingdom. And guys, you know, I have, uh, over the years, I have had a wide berth of people that I have interacted with, a lot of ministers. I can't even count the number of ministers. And you can sense those that are of kindred spirit. It doesn't matter the denomination that you're a part of. You cannot show me anywhere in the Word that Jesus commissioned denominations. He didn't do it. It's the same thing going back to what the Pharisees did. Now, I'm not, I'm not going against anything of men and women coming together for a common goal of glorifying Jesus. Denominations have done a lot of good. They have sent missionaries. They have done all these wonderful things. But when we almost get into denominational worship rather than the worship of the Messiah, we're falling into the same category as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, and you can feel it. There, is a, there can be a Baptist spirit of pride. There can be a Pentecostal spirit of pride. There can be a Messianic spirit of pride. All those, and, and, they, and they will take a mean turn. <laughs> How many, because you didn't jot every I and cross every T the, the Baptist way or the Assembly of God way or the Church of God way or what are, are the, the polythra of, uh, in fact, mo the, the, the growth within a, the, among the Baptist, the biggest movement is independent. And I heard one Baptist minister said, we, we just had to become independent because we couldn't get along with anybody but ourselves, you know. <laughs> and we had the same thing in all these other movements because we've lost sight of kingdom. Now, when the kingdom shows up, if you're not careful, 
your movement that you were a part of, that yes, God blessed God, but you took it beyond the scope of what it should have been, you could end up attacking the kingdom. We see this over and over again. Uh, Dr. Bill Hammond in his book, The Eternal Church, uh, really puts forth a paradox, and he does this all throughout church history of every major movement since the Reformation, that God, many times God will establish a truth. None of us have all the truth. Ain't none of us that smart. Okay? And so what the Holy Spirit does is, you guys over here develop reverence for God. You guys over here develop an understanding of the blood of Jesus. You guys over here understand an understanding of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You guys over here understand, develop an understanding of the Torah through the matrix of Messiah. And as you come and share, you enrich one another. Nobody's in competition in the kingdom. If there's competition, then you're trying to take the kingdom by violence. Come on. And right, we've seen this historically. There have been many things that have been in competition with the kingdom of God. We have the religious leaders in Jesus' day. Because they were trusting in Messiah the cornerstone that the men had rejected, and they were persecuted. Rome persecuted the church. What's funny to me, when you look at in history, Christians were persecuted because they did not worship Caesar, and they were burned alive, they were fed to lions. Then you have the church of Rome in its history. Millions of Protestants were killed and burned alive because they, own, they would only have fidelity toward Jesus and would not worship the church. Organization, personal relationship. In communism today, communism is one of the greatest threats to peace on this planet. The other one we might say could also be radical Islam. But in this system, why, why, one of the things I brought up with communism, number one, we're, we're in the middle of a communist revolution in America and in the Western world because the Luciferian elite have chosen communism as the platform to build the one world government. And it is in communism, when you, you start at, at progressivism and socialism and communism, the next logical step is Luciferianism. Okay? And historically... When you listen to what communists say, they will promise you anything. A chicken in every pot. Health care for everybody. Free college. Don't know how we're going to pay for it. I like what one politician over in England says, communism works great until you run out of other people's money. Okay? Eventually this stuff doesn't work. And historically it has not. Communism has killed millions upon millions upon millions of people either because of failed ideologies or direct persecution. And what has primarily been in the crosshairs because they say, listen, we're going to have this utopia. You know, Islam promised a utopia in Iran. It was going to be a caliphate, a Muslim utopia. Now, I want you to historically understand this. During the Soviet Union... They were the leading finance of all terrorism on planet Earth during their season. Okay? Iran comes up, and now with their utopia, they're the leading sponsor of terrorism on planet Earth. If you have to have terrorism to produce a utopia, you're not heading toward a utopia. You're heading toward a dystopian future, which all of them have. And they try by violence to take what only the kingdom of God can offer. You see, in the kingdom of God, there's equality. Poor, rich, we all have the same seat at the table. 
And one of the things I found is, is so cool. Now, I was kind of raised in this, so for me, the color of somebody's skin doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you're in kingdom, you're family. If you love Jesus with your whole heart, you're family. I don't care about the color of your skin. It's like all these roses out here. If we had, we had roses of all colors, could you see the red roses turning their nose down at the black roses or the white roses and say, we're everybody's favorite? Or the yellow roses? They're roses. And like every ethnic group, we all also have our thorns. <laughs> okay? Which you always have those problems with family. What communism cannot produce, what Islam cannot produce, what secular humanism cannot produce is what is produced in the kingdom that you can take someone that was in absolute torment and have nothing change externally around them and yet they find peace in the midst of the storm. Amen. What they want to do is level the playing field. When you really understand level the playing field, let's make everybody poor except for those at the top that are controlling everything. Because historically, in communism, that's the way it has always been. And what, what is beyond my comprehension is why we have billionaires funding communism. Guys, you're not going to be at the top. Because the ones that your foot soldiers view you as the problem. It's like, remember the Occupy Wall Street movement? All the speakers were millionaires complaining about the millionaires. It just, the kingdom is the answer. Jesus is the answer, but we've got to understand that the, the, the worldly system will be violent toward the kingdom as it manifests. And it takes us moving in greater depths in that kingdom to be able to counteract the violence that they're putting forth. But how do we do that? Do we react like the world? Do we get haughty and say, I'm in the kingdom, neener, neener, and you're not? You know, in our Constitution... There is a clause that they're already violating. It says there can't be no religious tests for public service. Originally, that was added in for the rare atheist or humanist or whatever they called them back then. They didn't want all the Christians that were the predominant force in much of the politics to alienate someone that wasn't Christian from serving in public office. That's the reason it's there. Now we're being told... You can't serve on, as a judge. You can't serve on the Supreme Court. They've gone as far as to say that you cannot hold public office if you're a Christian. That's in violation of the Constitution. But it's communism expressing its animosity because it can't ever deliver on the utopia that it promises. Now for the Christian, I can have a utopia on the inside and hell on the outside. I know from the Word of God it's only going to get really good on the outside when Jesus is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. And that is the blessed hope that I look for every day. I want, I want to see King Jesus on the news at night saying, this is what's going on on planet Earth. And the Word says that when He rules and reigns, that the Torah of God will flow from Jerusalem. Every rabbi, every Bible teacher, everybody's going to have to start taking notes because I find out, I, I've realized we all have it wrong in so many different ways. And the more I get stuck on self and pride, the further off I get from the kingdom and the correct application of the word. The carnality is killing us. Okay, so... I want to be one of the ones pressing into the kingdom, not one of the ones trying to take the kingdom by violence. How are we going to do that? Let's go to Mark chapter, 11, chapter 1. I know I have dealt with this many times, but I, I want to say this. Jew or Gentile, 
The only way that you could be a part of the kingdom is through repentance and acceptance of Messiah. If you reject the king, you don't get to be a part of his kingdom. Okay? Mark chapter 1, starting with verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Not the gospel of repentance alone, not the gospel of becoming a Baptist or a Pentecostal, the kingdom. Okay? That means he be king, you ain't. You serve him, he doesn't serve you. Oh, that just wrecked a lot of theology. Because our theology has turned God into a big Santa Claus. Sugar daddy in the sky. But Jesus said, listen now, when you're out working in the field, and you hire a guy at the first of the morning, get saved early in life. You get a guy, get saved at 30. You get a guy saved at 60. At the end of the day, the king chooses what he's going to pay him. And the gal get paid the same. We receive wages by living in the kingdom, serving our king, applying the word principles that untangle us out of Babylon so Babylon can't steal from us and the kingdom can prosper us. It's all about laboring in his field. Well, preacher, all of us can't be missionaries. All of us can't be preachers. Thank God. We need, we need Christian honest politicians that aren't part of Babylon. We need Christian law enforcement that aren't a part of Babylon. We need Christian doctors and attorneys and all this in every aspect I'm really wanting to be able to find a Christian contractor right now that will keep their word and do a good job. Because as we are scattered out in all of society, we are salt and light in every single one of those areas. As we serve the King and He blesses our endeavors as our wages in the kingdom. But we serve him, he doesn't serve us. Now, I can make my petitions before the king. I don't make demands before the king. I make petitions before the king. Because the, the only way, according to Jesus, is, okay, now they are preaching the kingdom of God. And they said, now, the, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Repentance is a way of life. For the believer. In fact, I have found in my life, and, and when, I, when I read after many wonderful men of God that came before us and generations before us, there would be times that the Holy Spirit would take them to a higher level of sanctification. And each one was preceded by a time of repentance. Repentance is the mechanism that takes you from faith to faith to glory to glory. Because it keeps us humble. It reminds me that I'm still in this world and the carnality of this world can still stick on me and mire my attitudes at any time. And so for God to do a deeper work calls deeper repentance. That's the only way that this thing works. And yet we're having theologies today that say, you know, once you, once you went to the altar that one time and you made Jesus Christ Lord save your life, after that moment you don't have to repent anymore. I'm thinking, how much of the New Testament have you not read? You don't even understand the purpose of the feasts. Of course, we did away with those and borrowed ones from paganism. Put a little jingy bell on them and all this other stuff that actually don't, don't, do not have the cycle of sanctification the feasts do because they're all about Messiah, His work in our lives, what He has done, where we are now, and what He's getting ready to do. And come quickly, Lord Jesus. Deliver us out of this mess. 
Repentance and faith in Messiah. So if you've not repented and you don't have faith in Messiah, you are not in the kingdom. In fact, I believe it was Mark chapter 12, Jesus taught a parable about a man who owned a vineyard and he had to go far away and then he sent his servants and they killed his servants. He said, well, they'll respect my son. And he said, I'm going to send my son. And they planned and killed his son. And basically what he said, the moral of the story is, you're getting ready to lose the kingdom. Because the son was the king. And only through the king can you enter into the kingdom. And I thank God today that every passing day there are more descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that are coming into the kingdom by the shed blood of Jesus. And I also thank God that more and more of us Gentiles that have come in by that shed blood are realizing the Old Testament was there for a reason. And that the law of Moses still applies. Sin is still sin. And it's offensive to the king. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. There's several principles here. And why, why, why I chose this one, in fact, we, we kind of commented it some on, on the, uh, this last podcast, Mary and I did this last week. He's, the, Hebrews chapter 12 is a hard book. It's a hard chapter. Okay? You better see to it that you don't reject he who is speaking from heaven. Remember, there was a bunch of Hebrew carcasses out in the wilderness between Egypt and, and the promised land. Okay, it can happen again. Even more so, we've not come to Mount Sinai, we've come to Mount Zion. You better see to it because our God is a consuming fire. Okay, in the midst of that he says, listen, there is a shaking coming. I don't quite think we're at that shaking. I think we see it in the book of Revelation where we actually have second heaven entities falling out of the second heaven because God done kicked them off their thrones, okay? And they're beginning to manifest in first heaven realities. And so the book of Hebrews is saying, listen, when all hell breaks loose like the earth has never seen before, see to it that you're part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Well, if it will work during the tribulation period, don't you think it'll work in America right now? Don't you think it'll work in Europe right now? Or Australia? Or New Zealand? Or Africa? It'll work right now if we'll understand the process. And in this verse... He, the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is the Apostle Paul, gives us three principles for ensuring that we are a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Verse 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now, first of all, this where it says we are receiving this Greek word is present, it's active, it's first person, but it is a, a circumstantial participle. You say, okay, what is the difference between that and the pickle, okay? It's active. We are receiving a kingdom. Right now, most of us are at about 5% in our tank. I want to get to 10%. I want to get to 20%. Peter got so full of the kingdom that if you could get close enough to his shadow, people were healed. How many know that's a tank that'd be running over? Woo, to have a tank that's running over. I am actively, it is a circumstantial. It is an act of my will and my obedience and my directing through repentance because repentance activates grace. Uh-oh. You mean all these hyper-faith people that are talking about grace and unmerited favor and all this stuff ain't got none? Yes! Because repentance 
When you are touched by saving faith, it gives you the ability to repent and receive. There are five aspects of grace. Now, for a detailed teaching on this, go back and listen to understand the kingdom part 24, but I do want to cover it here. There's unmerited favor. Grace. You didn't deserve it. I don't care how special your mama said you were. Okay? You didn't deserve it. For by grace we are saved. Not of works. You can't earn it. But you can surrender to it. That's what repentance is. I'm sorry. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender to the king. I accept what he did for me. I can't earn my way up. That's why he had to come down. Aren't you glad he did? Unmerited favor. But you got to step from unmerited favor and get into some saving grace. For it's by grace we are saved. If something on the inside of you doesn't change at that moment, you have not been touched by saving grace. The Bible is very succinct on this. Old things have got been, had just died at that moment. You have become a new creature. You have become a new creature that has new features, new attitudes. If that hasn't happened, you have not received saving grace because you didn't respond properly to God's unmerited favor. Now, grace is addictive. A little dab won't do you. Okay? Because once you receive saving grace, the next level, there's a, ne there's a next level. Quit trying to get saved and start becoming the saved. Then once you do, everything doesn't become a salvic issue. Well, I don't have to do that to be saved. No, you don't. But if you want to smell like kingdom, act like kingdom, and be a part of kingdom, you do got to do this. I think if God could open our eyes, the kingdom is like this vast kingdom with this vast territory, and there are a billion people stuck at the gate. Because they got through and sat down. Let me tell you something. The closer you are to the edge, the easier you can be shaken. Come on. The next step is transforming grace. Grace is radical. God gets up in your business and starts checking your attitudes, starts checking your belief systems. He'll get into your past on stuff you haven't let go of and say, boy, you need to let go of that. You know, most of the time we're like this kid that has his hand stuck in the candy jar and he's crying because he can't get his hand out of the candy jar. And the adult's saying, let go of the candy. No. Not realizing you pull your hand out and dump the jar, it'll come out. We're like that with our past. We're like that about our attitudes and the things that we have gathered up in our lives. We're not allowing the Word to transform our thinking and to, and to heal our souls. I'm tired of hearing in many churches the, the, the old testimony, the blood of Jesus, and baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit was good enough for me in 1942. It's still good enough for me today. Ain't got a thing since. Glory be His name. You sat down, baby. You sat down. You got into the kingdom and sat down. When there's this narrow path that just takes you further. Takes you further in the kingdom. You see, any place where grace transforms, the kingdom can flow. 
If you allow God to transform your relationships, the kingdom can flow. You let God transform your ideology of business, the kingdom can flow. But what we have done is we have resisted the transformation. And then it turns into an episode of an infomercial from Ronco on Christian TV. Just throw money at it. You don't need to change. Just send your money to P.O. Box and we're going to send five angels and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And You're thinking, well, you know, on channel 14, they only promised me five angels. I'm going to flip over here to channel 17 because I get 14 angels. Then they get radical because they, they try to go to like Psalms 146. So if you send $146 because Psalms 1 wouldn't have worked. <laughs> and I'm not talking to you. know, you're, you're supposed to give for the furtherance of the gospel. You give to where you're fed and you give to where you're seeing the kingdom preached because you want to see that replicated and that continue. Not to get you out of what your stinking attitude got you into because you wouldn't let God transform it. The only, and you know what? Let, let's say you did. Okay, here's $10, God. God takes you out and puts you right here out of that. Your stinking attitude within six months will get you right back to where you were because there was no transformation. So you spend your life trying to find somebody with a big enough whammy to pray for you to replicate that instead of having somebody to teach you the word and let transforming grace begin to change the way you do things and your attitude toward people, your attitude toward situations. I'll be the first to tell you Mike Lake has an attitude. And there have been so many times in my life I have had attitudinal adjustments by Almighty God, by Mary, both were anointed, okay, because until you have that attitude changed, you're your greatest enemy, and the flesh will fight to keep it. I've had this attitude for 47 years. Who are you to tell me that I need to change now? Well, you're alone. Everything is a disaster. You can't ever get anything off the ground. Do I need to go on? You see, God loves us. The grace is God loves us so much. He saves us in the stinking hole that we're in, but he loves us so much he doesn't want to keep us there. He wants to get us to where we can only be in him. That's this transforming grace. Only when you experiencing you have experienced transforming grace can you experience empowering grace. When Zerubbabel looked at the temple and it was almost an impossible thing to do, the prophet reminded him, It's not by might, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith Lord, but we quit there. And then he is instructed that when that temple is done, he is to stand in the middle of the temple and shout, Grace! The temple was rebuilt by grace. And let me tell you something. The temple of the living God in this generation is going to be built by empowering grace because there have been a people that have received saving grace and they're starting to get in this book and they're, they're crying out for transforming grace. And they come out of that, they come out of that like Jesus did out of, out of the, the 40 days in the wilderness. He went in because he was led by the Spirit of God. But when he came out, he came out in the power of God. And that's empowering grace. Whew, I want some of that. The last one. Enduring grace. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Faithful to the king to the very end. You see, when you get there, I live for the one, I die for the one. Not man, Jesus and Jesus alone. Whew. And you thought you knew grace. Grace is good. So much deeper. 
unmerited favor is the puddle before the kiddie pool. In fact, in this verse where it says we're receiving grace, it's charis in, in Greek where we get the word charismatic, the gifts. Grace is a gift. But he goes on to say, now listen, you've got to do it by grace, but how do you serve God? I tell you what, God's this so lucky he's got me in the kingdom because I know how to do this and I know how to do that. And I just don't think he could get along without me being in the... I have found that I can be replaced tomorrow. Easy breezy. You know, in the Bible that was solved with Balaam. His donkey brought correction to a guy that was supposed to be able to hear from Yahweh. He also heard from other spirits, but he heard from Yahweh. He's sitting there beating the donkey. I, I wish I could have seen the face of that guy. Donkey turns around, what's the matter with you? Why you hit me? There's an angel right there that's going to split your head wide open, dude. <laughs> he turned into Dr. Doolittle just like that. Do you know in the book of Revelation, I found out that I'm going to be replaced one day? That angels are going to preach the gospel from the heavens? Whew. And men will still reject it? Man! Evening news. A 42-foot angel was preaching the gospel, but it was not a part of the New World Order, and it's not news. Oh, how about the fires out in California? How much stuff is not covered? They're going to try to cover that up and reject it. The judgment that's coming, the Bible says they know Jesus is coming and they shake their fists in defiance. I don't want to be a part of that. You see, self is the spirit of Antichrist. Selflessness is the spirit of Christ. So how do I serve it says the only way to acceptably serve God is with reverence. Boy, that's been lost in the church, hadn't it? Looking at this in Logos, and I love the way that they, they, they not only give you all the lexicons, but they kind of amalgamate them all together and give you a sense of what this Greek or Hebrew word means. And I love this. Well, when you look at all the, the different ways that this, this Greek word can be translated and how it's used in all the various lexicons. It is self-conscious modesty. A self-conscious timidity which fears committing an act unworthy of oneself or representing oneself in an unworthy manner. You know what that's talking about? Carrying the name of God. I'm carrying the family name. I'm a part of the family business. What I do, how I live, my attitudes, my speech, my thoughts, my everything reflect back upon the Father. And one of the top ten is, Thou shall not make the name of the Lord, take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That is not using his name as a curse word. It's how you live as it cause other people to want to run to Jesus or run from him. And there's, a, there's an entire generation, the way that we have done Christianity, we have a generation running from Jesus. We are guilty of making the name of God vain in the earth. We forgot that I'm representing somebody else and my mannerisms, my customs had better represent the kingdom that I'm Representing, You know, when, when we send out an ambassador from America, he drives an American car. He wears American clothes. Even though he could afford it, he doesn't wear an Italian suit. He, it's American that he, he has said, this is, this is the position of America. You don't interject your own opinion. You interject because how you conduct yourself, everything that you say and do in the state dinners and the negotiations, everything represents America. 
And if you step outside of those lines, we'll yank you back so fast, your hair's going to hurt for a month. At least it should be that way. Where do we get that from? Our understanding of the Word. I carry the name of God in the earth, therefore I've got to serve Him with reverence, knowing that I carry the family name. You know, you may be the only image of Jesus somebody sees next week, a representative. They may see you in a situation where normally a, a regular person would get as mad and as hot as bacon on a hot griddle, and they see you smile and say, let's just step back and think about this for a minute. You see, you just showed them Jesus. You didn't have to get preachy with it. But it's the way that we conduct ourselves. Godly fear. The sense of what this means, because it can say, you know, discretion, caution, caution to prevent all, all or fear of God. It means a feeling of profound respect for deity. I respect God. And, and one of the ways to absolutely get into that transforming grace is when you respect what Jesus has done for you so much, you start saying no to the world. That's what begins activating that transforming and empowering grace in your life. I respect God too much. He's done too much for me. And let me tell you something. If, if God never answered another prayer except, Jesus, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Save me. Our life isn't long enough to repay that debt. If you never get that raise you've been praying for, if you never get that new car you've been praying for, all the things that we kind of associate with prayer, if none of those things ever come to pass, our life is too short to repay a life that He gave for us. Eternity, immortality came down to mortality and suffered horrors like we could not believe for us. Therefore, that should earn respect. Grace, repentance, grace, reverence toward God, godly fear, are the elements that establish you in a kingdom that you can become more full of. In fact, I'm going I'm to share this. I'm going to end with this. We have so misunderstood spiritual warfare, especially in light of 2 Corinthians, where it talks about strongholds. That's not on the outside, that's on the inside. You have spiritual territory on the inside that you have got to drive out the yites to let the kingdom fill. That's why we need transforming grace. That's why we need empowering grace. That's why we need enduring grace. And our theology has been the little devil do you once saved, always saved. He can't get me out no matter how much of a spoiled brat and that I am in the kingdom. I tell you what, there's going to be a lot of people that Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Because if I knew you and you knew me, you'd sure acted a whole lot different than what you did. How many of us have had a kid every once in a while we wonder, whose family were you raised in? <laughs> In that moment, you forgot who raised you and the attitudes that was in the house. I just don't know if I know you. Well, sometimes you can have kids come over from the neighborhood that doesn't make them yours. And I think we've had a lot of that going on in the kingdom. They can try to cast out devils in his name. They can build hospitals in his name. And he said, you never received saving grace. You never sought transforming grace. You never received empowering grace. And you sure ain't got enduring grace. And there's not, a, there's not any kingdom that I could see anywhere in you. My job, when I'm, full, when, I'm, when I'm done in life, is I want to be full of the kingdom. 
In fact, I think for a believer, our task is, when are we ready to get out of here? When we're so full of the kingdom that the earth can't hold us anymore. That, that's why I look at people like Smith Wigglesworth. Can you imagine be so full of the kingdom that he knew the day that he was supposed to go home? He's preaching a message. Death shows up, and he says, you're going to have to wait 15 minutes. I'm not done preaching yet. There's some people that I've got to pray for over here to get saved. There's some people over here I've got to pray to get healed. And, he, and he, he actually stopped right in the middle of his sermon, just looked at something and said, not yet. According to witnesses, does all that, goes in the, you know, back then there was always a, before TV, there was a chair for preachers to sit, you know. He sat down and just went, and he was gone. Baby, that is what you call enduring grace. Enduring grace. Because he was full of the kingdom to the very last moment. Death could not shake him. May it be so with each one of us. Let us be found faithful. To steal from the Marines, Semper Fi. Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Always faithful to the king. Always wanting to get closer to the throne. Everybody's trying to find the mystery of finding that secret place of the Most High God. It's in the shadow of his throne. You get there and you live from there. Humbled before a righteous king. Now, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would give us the grace to be transformed into that kind of people that will change a generation. To represent your kingdom that will always be faithful to the king. And Father, with the transformation, endure empowerment and enduring to your people. Let strength come with a holy passion for you and a holy passion for lost souls in this generation, we ask. In Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual, you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the kingdom of God in the Bible, and who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the Principality's Wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end-time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The kingdom priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. 
www.biblicallifetv.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.